At over 4 million acres, Katmai National Park and Preserve has a vast landscape full of alpine tundra, volcanic and glacial features, sedge meadows, spruce forests, and more. It also contains nearly 500 miles of coastline. And today we are talking about one of Katmai's most enig enigmatic creatures, the wolves of coastal Katmai. Welcome everyone to today's live chat on the explore.org bear cams. I am Ranger Leon Law, and today I am pleased to introduce our guest, Ellen Dimmitt. She was a guest researcher at Catby this past summer, and she is working on her PhD in wildlife science at Oregon State University. As always, don't forget that you can ask questions throughout the live chat in the comments, and we hope to answer as many of those as possible at the end of this program. But to start us off a little bit, can you tell us of the research that you're doing? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to chat with you about wolves. And um, as a background for the project, so wolves have been seen very often on the Katmai coast for a long time um, at locations like Hallow Bay and also you know, further north and south on the park's coastline, but we don't really know anything about them. So our project is kind of the first formal investigation into the lives of these wolves living out on the coast. And we're really focused on basic natural history questions about them, such as how many packs are there, how many individuals per pack, um, what, how is their you know, population structure sort of organized, and uh, importantly, what are they eating? And I know people here watching today may be familiar with wolves at Brooks campus. We do sometimes see them on the cams, but why are we looking at coastal wolves in particular? So Katmai's coastal wolves are eating some really interesting stuff. Um, this project kind of stemmed originally from observations of wolves carrying dead sea otters that were sighted at Hallow Bay and other locations, um, just carrying, you know, the otter carcasses up the beach. And that's kind of an interesting new uh, prey option for wolves. So we really wanted to look more into how wolves are using marine resources. The Katmai Coast is a really good kind of case study for this question because um, other than a couple of moose, there aren't really many large hooved mammal options for wolves on the coast. Um, you know, wolves are typically thought of as like an obligate deer predator, um, but uh, the wolves on the Katmai Coast are clearly not choosing this strategy. So we wanted to look more into, um, yeah, wolf utilization of marine resources. Okay. Um, so can you kind of walk us through a typical day in the field? What kind of data are you collecting to get this information? Yeah, so this project, project is all about scat collection. Um, fecal DNA specifically is how we are able to study wolf diet. We can collect entire scats from wolves and also other carnivores and then do laboratory analysis that will allow us to tell exactly which species they have eaten um, based on the remnant prey DNA in these scats. So a typical day in the field involves a lot of wolf poop. We are walking beaches, we are walking bear trails, um, and really just kind of any area where we expect wolves to be traveling or hanging out and looking for these poops. And then we're collecting them into tubes with a storage solution in them that we can then bring all the way back to the lab in Oregon um, to analyze for wolf diet. Now, beyond the scat collection, we're also setting up trail cameras um, to try and get video of wolves. Uh, we can get minimum count of individuals at a location from like who we see showing up on the camera. So it's helpful to cross reference, you know, our camera data with what we find in the scat collection. Um, we also set up in the, you can see in these photos here, some of these bear proof tripods that are actually going to be left out over winter at uh, ex or at locations where we expect seals and sea otters to be hauling out of the water. And with these, the goal is to try and get um, predation on camera. Um, both wolves and bears are suspected of targeting marine mammals that are hauled out of the water. So that's the hope with those. And then finally, we're also setting hair snares. So that's literally just barbed wire wrapped around a log and then baited with um, a scent lure. 
uh, that induces wolves and bears to have this kind of like scratch and rub response. They like the stinky smell and they'll rub themselves up against the log. And then we're able to collect the hair they leave behind on the barbed wire and use this in um, DNA analysis as well. And I think you also mentioned that you found quite a few other things too. Um, you follow the tracks and the scat to find den areas, correct? Yeah, we've been able to find uh, several den and rendezvous sites on the coast. So a wolf pack, when the pups get old enough, they move from their den site to usually an open area where the pups have more room to play. And this is called a rendezvous site. So we've been able to locate several of these on the coast, which is really helpful, not just because it's a gold mine of genetic um, evidence like scat and fur, um, but also because it kind of gives, gives us a clue as to what are the habitat requirements for wolves on the Katmai coast. And what we found with this is that it's um, much different than what we would typically expect um, a wolf pack to choose for their den sites. The dens on the Katmai coast are very close to the ocean and in some cases pretty far away from fresh water. So that kind of gives us a clue that they might be prioritizing access to these marine resources even over easy access to fresh water for their pups, which is just really fascinating um, and atypical for, you know, what we usually think of for wolf den selection. I think that's pretty fascinating about the dens. And I know that I have never been in one. And it looks like you have. Um, I know that I'm also much more familiar with bear dens, um, which are very different. So can you tell us like what it's like to be in there? Do they have multiple entrances? How big are they? Like how large are these packs that are using these? So give us a little specifics there. Yeah, well, first of all, I'll say that the dens smell like wolf pee. Um, wolf pee probably smells exactly like how you would imagine it to smell. Uh, it's not very good. But the reason I'm crawling into those is to actually get hair samples that are left behind by the mother and pups. So when we arrived at all of these den sites, the wolves had already moved on to these rendezvous areas that I mentioned earlier. So they were not occupied any longer. But even so, we try to spend, you know, an hour or less on the den just because we don't want to, you know, alarm the wolves or make them uncomfortable. They might, you know, leave the area if they feel threatened by us. Um, but yeah, it, it just kind of uh, mindfully collecting uh, hair and scats from those locations and, uh, we found um, at one of the den sites, you know, a, a typical wolf den will have like several entrances and will be usually kind of concealed in shrubs or in trees. But the dens we're seeing in Katmai are often dug into a big open field. Uh, we think this might be because they need to prioritize having a lookout for bears, um, especially when they have young pups. Um, and also only a couple of them only had one entrance, which we thought was interesting. That's um, a little bit different from what we typically see with wolves. So. Yeah, another another thing that makes the Katmai Coastal Wolves unique. And the method that you talked about, like using scat tracks and hair snares, um, but you're not using any collaring or data, is that correct? Yeah, so our project is all non-invasive, meaning that we're not catching any wolves. And um, this is cool for a couple of reasons. The first is that the wolves in Katmai have never been trapped or shot at um, unless, you know, they experienced that while they were outside of the park. Um, but as a result of this, they're not really afraid of people. So if you see wolves someplace like, I don't know, Montana, for example, um, it's most likely that they'll run away from you or at least try to hide. Um, but in Katmai, we literally had wolves taking naps, um, you know, like, 100 feet away from us. And um, that type of experience is really unique for park visitors. So we want to um, preserve the opportunity for interactions like that by, you know, kind of maintaining this uh, relationship with the wolves where they're not afraid of humans. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's a lot easier logistically for researchers to not have to capture um, a large carnivore in order to study them. So really um, honing in on these methods of non-invasive genetic sampling and camera trapping for studying large carnivores is going to be really important as um, the, you know, the field of carnivore ecology research moves forward. Very interesting. And then I know like another non-invasive um, method that you're also kind of pioneering at the same time is actually getting DNA from tracks. Is that correct? 
Yes. So this has been done before for Wolverine and Lynx um, researchers. I can't remember the exact teams, but have been able to get um, DNA out of snow um, from left behind in footprints of uh, Wolverine and Lynx. So we're trying um, out to see whether this will work with tracks in the sand. So prioritizing um, tracks that we have actually seen the wolves make. So we know exactly how old they are. Uh, we scrape the top layer of the sand into these collection tubes that are filled with uh, another DNA preservation buffer. Um, and then the hope is that we will be able to get enough um, you know, trace wolf DNA out of these to actually genotype the individual. So that would mean we can tell which wolf left the track just by analyzing the DNA left behind in the footprint. So that would be very cool if it works. We'll see. I'm actually going to find out tomorrow whether my first batch of extractions from these tracks have DNA in them. Uh, so everybody out there, please keep your fingers crossed <laughs> and stay tuned because this would be very cool if it works. It would mean that we don't need to find scat in order to genotype carnivores, um, which would be really important for applications in environments like tropical environments where scat degrades really fast. It would make it a lot easier to use non-invasive genetic sampling techniques to study um, cryptic species. Well, fingers crossed for tomorrow. I feel like we, we should have just had this a day later. <laughs> um, but yeah, that sounds really, really interesting. It's basically like forensics for other animals, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Um, nice. So after this first field season at Katmai, what, what do we know so far after your scat collection and your hair and then the camera traps? What can you tell us that we are learning? So much exciting stuff about wolf diet. They're eating all sorts of crazy things that we didn't know wolves were eating. Um, we've seen just, you know, beyond getting the DNA out of the scat, you can tell when you're digging through the poop what the wolf has eaten because they're not very good at chewing things. So we know that they're eating clams, both soft shell clams and razor clams, which we know the bears eat as well. So that's not that much of a surprise, but still cool to see. Um, they're also eating mussels, which is interesting from um, sort of a toxicology uh, perspective, because in places like Southeast Alaska, these um, mussels can have really high levels of toxicity. So that's another kind of interesting research area we want to explore some more is whether these wolves are being exposed to things like paralytic shellfish poisoning um, through their marine diets. Um, probably the most obscure thing we've seen in wolf scats is feather worms. So these like tube worm creatures you might see in um, tide pools. Uh, we keep seeing the exoskeletal like tube um, in the wolf scats. And this isn't that surprising, I guess, because the balls of these um, worms when they die wash up on the beach and they smell really fishy. So a wolf strolling down the beach might think that that's a good snack. Um, but that's cool because that's never been demonstrated as a um, part of wolf diet before. Uh, we know that they must be prying snails and chitons off of the rocks in the inter intertidal zone as a snack as well, because we're seeing those shells turn up in the scats. Um, and then predictably, we're seeing that they eat a lot of sea otter and also a lot of um, harbor seal. We uh, are seeing those remains pretty consistently in the scat. And this is a really cool picture. Um, this was taken by a visitor to the park uh, back in 2018, I believe. And this is a young wolf, maybe one year old wolf with a young um, otter pup in its mouth. So this kind of demonstrates that the sea otter utilization is really a strategy for these wolves. Um, and we actually can back this up with our, um, you know, observations when we were visiting uh, Swick Shack Bay on uh, the Katmai coast, we saw three wolves um, hunt and kill an otter pup that was hauled out on a little rock scurry offshore. And we actually watched them kill and eat the pup. So we know that the sea otter um, consumption is not just scavenging, they're also hunting them. Um, and we think that this is, you know, a, a strategy for them rather than opportunistic because every single morning we would see fresh wolf tracks leading to the haul out area. And we watched on several occasions um, wolves kind of patrolling the beach go up and make sure that they checked the haul out for any, you know, unaware otters um, as kind of a part of their morning routine. Uh, so that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, it, it it's happening in Southeast Alaska as well. Um, but, you know, probably happening a lot of other places along the Gulf of Alaska and the Pacific coast in general that we, um, you know, haven't discovered yet. So 
pretty cool. Rewriting must, our you must have been able, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you must have been able to see a whole lot while you were out there. And when you were mentioning that about them hunting, so when I think about wolves, I my first thought about wolves are wolves in um, Yellowstone, for instance, hunting in packs. And so it sounds like that's something that they still do here, even if they aren't hunting moose or caribou. So is that basically correct in summarizing what you saw too? Yeah, they definitely still work together. In this instance, actually, it was one wolf came first and then saw the otter. Um, and then we watched, she just kind of hunkered down behind a rock. We think she was upwind of the otter, so it couldn't, you know, detect her. And then she waited maybe 20 minutes. And then sure enough, two members, the, she was the breeding female of this pack, we think, um, and the breeding male and one um, other individual who was probably a pup from previous litter they had um, came up the beach um, and joined her. And then once they arrived, that was when they worked together to kill the otter. So that's, you know, that typical kind of pack hunting behavior. But we also see wolves getting prey individually more often on the Katmai Coast than, um, you know, in other systems, probably because the prey are a lot smaller bodied. So like a wolf doesn't need a whole pack to help it catch fish. Um, so we'd see, you know, at some locations, like one wolf on its own would stand in the river and catch fish for a couple of hours. Or um, in another observation at Swickshack, one wolf killed a harbor seal by itself and struggled with it for maybe 20 minutes. Um, but then after it was able to kill the seal, um, it left and then came back with another individual from its pack to eat it. Um, you know, to share share its kill um, with its pack members. So there's definitely still, you know, the kind of family unit of the pack in operation on the Katmai coast, but um, because the prey they're killing are different, their strategies are different as well. Interesting. And then, you know, as we're talking about wolf packs, can you give us a little more information on perhaps um, the population that we have here in Katmai and how large a territory do these packs have? I'm glad you asked that because that's another really interesting thing we discovered from our work this summer. And um, of course, we haven't finished the lab analysis yet, so we don't have the you know genotyping results to tell you exactly how many wolves there are at a minimum yet. Um, we will be able to say that soon. But for now, what we can tell is that um, there are a lot of different wolf packs on the Katmai coast. And we typically think of a wolf as having this massive ter territory per pack. Um, usually because they have to follow migratory ungulate herds in order to have access to prey consistently. So on like the North Slope, there are wolves with like 15,000 square kilometer territories that they hold. But on the Katmai Coast, when most of their food is coming from the river and the ocean, or at least a large portion of their diet is coming from there, um, they don't have as much incentive to move around. So it seems like a lot of them just kind of hunker down in these bays and localize there and don't really leave you know if they were to walk up valley they just hit glaciers and mountain and there's not really a reason for them to go and then on either side of the bay there's typically big mountains as well so what we're finding is that the katmai coast is this like assemblage of nested packs per bay and you'll get locations right next to each other like um for example, Katmai Bay and Dakavak in the south part of the Parks Coast. Um, we think that there are maybe as many as three, definitely two, but maybe as many as three different wolf packs kind of crammed into that area, which is sort of unprecedented um, because that's a very small territory. I mean, Dakavak Bay is like not even five miles wide and, and there's an entire wolf pack being sustained within there. Hmm. Um, and then Hallow Bay and Swick Shack is another example of this where we have a different pack at each location. They're right adjacent to one another. Um, and then up in the north part of the park, there's several packs probably at in Kamishak Bay and maybe also a distinct one at Dakavak. So, uh, yeah, a lot of wolves on the coast. And we think that this is made possible by the year round supply of marine prey and particularly otters at places like Swick Shack. Um, and otters are able to have pups year round. So it's not like there's like a season when they can get otter. Um, they have access to them whenever, you know, whenever they're able to get a pup. Um, and otters are also thought to be at carrying capacity on the Katmai coast, which means that they're washing up dead pretty often. So that's another year round source of food for them. That means they don't have to really leave the beach. They can just kind of hang out there and uh, have enough food. Nice. So it's a basically year round food. And then also it seems like an abundance of food too. So um, yeah, 
an abundance of food, and then that combined with the geographic isolation of each bay by the mountain range. Nice. Um, and then let's talk a little bit more about in the field, right? Do you have any of the, I know you've described some of them, but perhaps some other interesting observations that you've seen. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about a wolf bear interaction we saw. Um, there are these three individuals who came up to kill Oh, you're okay. This video, this is a different, this isn't the one I was going to describe, but this is very cool. Um, you can show that if you'd like. Uh, this is, um, I described earlier the wolves taking a nap, like right across from us. So that's what's happening here on the right side of the screen. You can see this wolf has been lying down. She knew we were there. She just didn't particularly care. Um, and then you have this subadult brown bear coming along. Um, he doesn't really need to walk towards her, but he's choosing to do so. And the wolf does not seem to be especially uh, disturbed by it. So this is a, I think this is a really cool interaction because, you know, you think, ah, oh, wolves, bears, they're two top predators. They're going to fight whenever they run into each other and they're going to compete directly. Um, but here they're just kind of uh, annoyed with one another. It's almost like a disgruntled neighbor interaction. You see the bear just kind of displaces the wolf and she doesn't really want to move, but she also doesn't want to fight with them. So... That's pretty cool. Uh, and then another wolf bear interaction we saw, um, these wolves that went to kill the otter, the younger individual, the one I said was probably a pup from their previous litter, uh, decided to, um, just for fun it seemed, antagonize a, a sow with three um, yearlings. And uh, the cubs at this point were about the same size as the wolf, but still they did kind of like a back and forth charging thing. Um, with one another just kind of i don't know if it was dominance related or just kind of like testing each other out or if this wolf was just you know being a teenager and the bears were just being teenagers um but that, that was pretty special to see uh and then i guess my fav one of my favorite stories from the summer was the first time we saw a wolf um on the coast we were at dakavak bay and we were watching a juvenile eagle and an adult eagle fight in the air over a um, flounder uh, that they had caught, one of them had caught. And while they were fighting, they dropped it. And we saw them drop it, we saw where it landed. And then we looked down the beach and a, there was a wolf that had come down that had heard them fighting and had also seen them drop the fish. And the wolf was like looking for the opportunity to go get the fish. Um, so I thought that that was really cool because you know, every, everything is in tune with one another. And she was, you know, taking advantage of that opportunity to uh, get a free snack. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I find it fascinating to hear you talk about all the different inter interactions and especially like the, the wolf bear interactions, because are they really competing for the same resources or can you talk a little bit more about that too? Yeah, so um, that vi video, I think kind of, illustrated well that there has to be some degree of tolerance you know they're not buddies but they do they are sharing space and they are sharing food resources so they're definitely used to seeing one another um i think another good illustration of um the kind of wolf bear relationship on the coast was that when we were up on kamashak a humpback whale carcass had washed up on the beach and there were um 13 uh male bears eating the carcass together at the same time and of course they're doing their own little dominance thing you know playing king of the hill on top of the carcass and taking turns eating it. Um, and a wolf came along one morning and was also eating the carcass alongside these 13 bears. So when there's an abundance of food, um, there's less kind of direct aggression because there's enough to go around. Um, what we don't know is how this interaction plays out in the instance of, um, you know, a scarce food source. So for example, if you know, wolves and bears are fishing on the same salmon run and the run is lower than it has been in previous years. Um, does that impact the way that they share space and the way they interact with one another? And these things are really difficult to study because you have to be in the right place and the right time to see these interactions happen. And it's difficult to catch anything on camera on the Cat My Coast because the bears will destroy the cameras most of the time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, still a lot of questions um, to answer about wolf bear interaction on the coast but i think generally i'd say that they tolerate one another because there's enough food for everyone
Very nice. And yeah, I hope your cameras make it through the winter because uh, we're going to love to see some of that footage too. So <laughs> yeah, there's another, um, that's another thing that I would like everyone to cross their fingers for. It would be great <laughs> if the bears choose not to destroy these tripods. I think that they could take them down if they were motivated to do so. So hopefully they, you know, are fans of our research as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, and then let's talk a little bit more about some of the data because you, you have mentioned like what you have been seeing them eat, but can you give us some more preliminary results? Um, are they kind of right now so far? I know you're just in the beginning of analyzing everything, but are you finding what you expected? Are there any kind of surprises or? So something, uh, we were able to analyze 84 scats um, collected in 2019 already. So we have preliminary metabarcoding results from these scats. And um, they demonstrated that the wolves in the Brooks Camp area and the park's interior are eating very different things from the wolves on the coast, which is what we expected. But what I thought was kind of unexpected and interesting is the breadth of things that wolves in both places are eating and how it seems, you know, after this summer, we have, you know, kind of more detail about, you know, what wolves at different locations are eating differently. So at Swick Shack, I already talked a lot about how often they're getting otters, but at Dakavak Bay, um, the wolves there are actually eating mostly ground squirrel, Arctic ground squirrel. So this population has, uh, or this pack has really um, specialized on ground squirrel. They were, you know, the team was recently out there and saw them feeding ground squirrel to their pups and teaching their pups how to hunt ground squirrel. So it's not like, you know, all wolves on the coast have the same strategy. Um, and you can't really lump together like cat my coastal wolves are all eating this because it really depends on within an individual bay what resources are available to them so i'm really looking forward to you know getting um the results from this summer back because we'll be able to show at each location what are the wolves eating and how does that relate to the availability of different prey options so at a location like Dakavak, where there aren't as many small islands close to the shore it makes sense that they wouldn't be getting otters as often because they don't have those opportunities um but you know up on you know the northern parts of Katmai where you do have these potential haul out areas but you also have access to things like ground squirrels and squirrels in the trees as well um what are the wolves choosing in that instance so stay tuned it's very for more of that information but yeah that kind of uh partitioning of packs across the coast is really interesting to me yeah, and you'll be able to get so specific too as to even sometimes be able to tell like which or how many wolves were feasting on this one in particular otter through the scat too, correct? Yeah, so our lab has a method of genotyping called genotyping by single nucleotide polymorphism. So we call that SNPs, SNPs for short. Um, and the way that that works is that we're able to look at the DNA of individuals. Um, so, you know, say you have five wolf scats, five different wolves, um, you'd be able to tell the individuals apart based on the genetic variation expressed in their DNA. So all of us have single base pair differences in our DNA. That's what makes up genetic variation. And when we're able to track that, we can tell individuals apart from their DNA. So the next question is if we can tell wolf DNA apart from wolf scats, can we also tell um, the difference between individual prey in their scats? So if an otter was eaten by a wolf, um, can we tell which otter that was out of all of the otters we've sampled? And can we tell how many different wolves ate the same otter and how many different otters were eaten by a single wolf? Um, and that sort of question will, will allow us to non-invasively and pr pretty easily um, you know, look more closely at the interaction between the wolf population and the otter population writ large. Wow, that's fascinating that you would can get so much information from SCAT. Who knew? <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> SCAT is the future. <laughs> We're going to write that down as your quote, so <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> Um, and then like, lastly, before we move to questions, you know, it also just so happens that coincidentally, this is Wolf Awareness Week. So this is really well timed. So with that in mind, as we're kind of wrapping up here, do you have any final insights? What do wolves have to teach us here at Katmai? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, like I was saying earlier about the wolf and deer, like people think of wolves as being 
typical hunters of elk, hunters of deer, you know, black tailed deer, whatever. And that uh, for some people, this is kind of the root of the wolf hatred is like, oh, the wolves are eating the deer I want to hunt or the wolves are eating, you know, my cattle, um, something like that. Uh, is disproven in part by, you know, our results in Katmai, which show that wolves aren't always just eating deer. Sometimes they're sea otters instead. Sometimes they're eating a lot of fish. And, you know, this kind of understanding of the wolf as the deer hunter is not always the case, um, especially not along the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, so I guess if uh, I could impart one, uh, like, result on the world, it would be that wolves are much more flexible in their diet than we've been taught to think of. Um, and they're much more adaptable to what resources are available to them. Um, they're able to eat a lot of different things, you know, just like a coyote or a fox is thought of as a generalist carnivore. Wolves are generalists in the same way um, and yeah, can survive in all sorts of environments as a result of that, including the beach. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, if you don't mind, we'll stick around and take a few live audience questions before we wrap up here. Yeah, oh, that sounds great. All right. So first question, why do you think the wolves were not around Brooks River this year and the numbers that they were in 2020? Interesting. So it could be that wolves have found a better strategy that does not require them to be around as many bears. Um, it's Although they tolerate one another, it is risky for a wolf, especially a wolf with young wolves, to be at the falls when they're all of those sort of dominance interactions are happening amongst the bears. Um, so, I mean, that would be kind of one idea. It could be just they found another way to get food. Um, we were doing some camera trapping around Brooks Camp area and um, know that the pack is hanging out on the Valley Road a lot. So maybe they found, you know, beaver or squirrels or something to eat there instead. That's just one idea. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we don't have cameras everywhere, so <laughs> they could definitely and be could there be just and we're just we're, not we're missing seeing them. Yeah, exactly. It could just be that you're, you know, the wolves have decided that they would rather come to Brooks Falls at two in the morning when it's not so crowded. And that's why it seems like there's not as many. It could be, you know, it could be that they, uh, the pack is smaller. Maybe they fragmented and some of them went up the valley further. Um, maybe they all moved to the coast. We'll find out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's hard to judge um, animal behavior from you know, anecdotal observations and like infrequent camera observations. So what you're saying is we just need more wolf studies everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You need, you need to appoint somebody to camp overnight at the Brooks Falls platform and watch out for those sneaky 2 a.m. wolves. <laughs> and then we'll really know what's going on. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, next question. Were bears a hindrance while you were doing your collections? It's a good question. Um, I'd say the bears were, for the most part, very polite. Uh, the one issue we did have is that they really like the scent lure that we put on the log to attract wolves. Um, so there's not really a way to attract wolves without also attracting bears. Um, and in one instance at Hallow, actually, we had put the scent lure on a log and two bears literally within a minute of us putting out the lure came over. And even though we were standing right there, they walked right up and started rubbing on the log. And then we had to, you know, hurry, get our backpacks and, you know, stand together as a group and do all the things that you do. Um, so yeah, we had to be very careful with setting out the lure. And it was almost like, uh, you know, by the end of the season, it would be like, okay, everybody's got their backpack on, we're ready to go. And the very last thing we're going to do is put the lure on the log. And then we're going to hightail it out of here because the bears are going to come in hot really quickly. Um, and then, yes, we did lose some cameras to the bears. As I mentioned, um, there were some that were uh, destroyed, but I guess the silver lining to that is that we now have these really funny videos of the bears destroying the cameras that I'm excited to share uh, with the world as well. <laughs> Very nice. So any idea what these wolves do in the wintertime? Do they head off to greener pastures or they stay? And it sounds like you might have touched on this, but can you elaborate a little bit more? 
Oh, I mean, I, this is a great question. I have this exact same question. Um, I would love to study wintertime wolf diet. Um, we're trying to get additional funding to be able to do some trips out to the coast in the wintertime to collect scats as well. Um, but my kind of guess would be that as long as the coast remains, um, as long as they have access to marine resources, which they do, I mean, like the ocean's not going to freeze obviously. And the, um, Cat my coast doesn't get particularly icy or snowy um that they would stay um and that the winter time would actually be more of an incentive for them to stick to you know close to the beach because you know the marine the otter resources and the fish and the shellfish are going to be there all throughout the winter um while you know the resources um towards the interior of the park are going to be a little bit less accessible um, during that time. So, um, you know, usually what we see is like a wolf pack will broaden its movement, um, and, you know, be less confined to a home area in the winter time because they're having to move around more to track prey and get enough food for themselves. Um, I think that the opposite might even happen in Katmai where you get kind of a contraction of the wolves, um, to a kind of localize around the beach, um, where they have access to marine, prey options all throughout the winter. But we'll see. I mean, we definitely, that's just a hypothesis. I, I'm very interested in this question as well, though. Nice. And I hear that we have 30 questions loaded up, but we're going to take three more. <laughs> and then maybe <laughs> okay, um, wow. we can look in the chat and answer some more of those for folks if you're willing. But we'll take three more live. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> excellent. So, so is it easy is to it... differentiate? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's possible. It's possible. I, I, it was kind of a roller coaster this summer, um, where towards the beginning, I was like, I have no idea how to tell the difference. And then in the middle, I was like, okay, I think I'm getting a feel for this. And then by the end, I started second guessing myself because I'd be like, wow, this wolf fur really looks like bear fur or wow, this bear fur really looks like wolf fur. Um, so we have a lot of fur samples some of them are probably bare. That's just the way that it has gone. Um, but under a microscope, yes, they can be differentiated. And if um, it is wolf's guard hair, which is actually the hairs that we're looking for, for um, you know genotyping and for stable isotope analysis, um, you actually get like a banding of colors on the hair typically. So it'll be like a white hair shaft with like a black stripe in the middle or something like that. And that, you know, I can say is definitively wolf when I see that on a snare. But if it's the undercoat and it's kind of wiry, uh, and, you know, cream colored, then it all looks the same to me. And, you know, there's a lot of funny pictures of the field from the field of me, like squatting over the log with a hair in my face, trying to tell the <laughs> difference. Um, so it's definitely hard. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Do the rangers know the wolves like we know the bears? So ide uh, individual identification. Um, we're get we're starting to. We're um, getting a sense for, you know, who the breeding couple is at least for each pack um you'll and it's you know the wolves they have very distinctive coat patterns so it it's easy even from a distance um, or through a spotting scope to um recognize a wolf when you've seen it for the second time um like oh this is the wolf we saw um the other day and we are you know kind of amongst ourselves we've given some of them names and we're doing all of that for fun I haven't made it public yet but um once we have these genotypes uh maybe we'll be able to you know post some photos of the wolves that we have seen um and have the public be able to follow along with the lives of these individuals as well very interesting. And I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so what are your thoughts on Katmai wolves adaptability to climate change? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think it kind of um, being so dependent on marine resources puts them in a tricky position um, in, you know, the hypothetical world where marine resource availability is depleted by a warming ocean or by, you know, changing winter conditions or whatever. Um, so I think that the, the ability of wolves to switch between different prey options is a good thing. Um, so like if there is a massive bird die off and the wolves were eating a lot of birds, it's good to know that they can just switch to eating something else as long as there's still an alternate prey option available. And I think, you know, our work on like the plasticity of wolf diet um, demonstrates that these switches are possible. 
Um, but I think, you know, if they become too reliant, if certain packs are like entirely reliant on, you know, salmon run timing as an important food source for them or for their pups, especially, um, then they could get into some trouble when um, the kind of uh, predictability of those resource pulses um, becomes uh, more uncertain with changes in climate. Thank you absolutely for sharing some of your insights and thoughts. And I will just give like a quick little backstory. We actually tried to pre-record this here in the field when I was at Katmai <laughs> Bay um, with Ellen. But you know, Katmai's weather is pretty notorious. We did it inside of a tent. It didn't look very good. So I'm really happy that you could do this live with us and share your exciting research here at Katmai. Um, don't forget that we also have another live chat next week. It is about bear lang language with um, Ranger Nick, which was pre-recorded earlier this summer. Um, but thank you, Ellen, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today and all of your questions. And thank you to all of the Explore staff. And as they say at Explore, never stop learning. <laughs>